what I want to do with today's presentation really is uh, just give an overview of our work uh, on wrongful convictions, um, talk a little bit about how we generally work on promoting the rule of law in Asia and how this project fits into our work, and also talk about some of the things we learned. Um, so um, this is kind of the, the principles that sort of govern how we decide what to do. You know, we look at what are the needs of the host country that we're working at. We look at what are the openings for reform. And we look and see whether or not we have the resources or access to the resources that we can bring to bear on whatever that challenge is. Uh, we've worked traditionally on uh, criminal justice, especially human rights aspects of criminal justice, international law. Uh, Jerry and Peter Dutton and others just had a lengthy Law of the Sea uh, symposium yesterday. And we've also worked on public interest law, anti-discrimination, labor law, land rights. Frank led a land rights program for us several years ago, and uh, also comparative law. So why did we choose to work on wrongful convictions? Um, uh, it's, you know, wrongful convictions obviously touches on criminal justice reform, which is uh, an area we worked on in the past, and there is a great need in China. Uh, I've noted here some of the issues, but not all of them. China has a high rate of pretrial detention, long periods of uh, detention, um, coerced confessions, very few witnesses. So there's a lot to do in criminal justice reform in China. As far as opportunities go, beginning in 2010, China for the first time acknowledged that it had a problem with wrongful convictions and that created a big opening to do this kind of work. And then in terms of our own resources and access to resources, um, you know, uh, probably in large part because of the work of the Innocence Project, but also many other experts, we had access to tremendous expert resources um, to work on these issues. So it, was, it met all of our criteria for a project. Um, this is some of the previous criminal justice work we've done uh, on China. This is uh, a couple of books that we've published. Um, um, and this goes in terms of opportunity. I just wanted to spend a minute talking about this case from 2010, the Zhao Zhuai Hai case. Probably many of you know about this case. Um, this was one of several cases, not the first time, but one of an important case where this gentleman, Zhao Zhuai Hai, had been previously convicted of murdering his neighbor in a small village in Henan province. And he had been in jail for 10 years when his neighbor, the supposed victim of the murder, um, reappeared in the village. And that case just received national attention in China. Uh, and even though we have exonerations uh, on an almost weekly basis here in the United States, they don't receive that much attention. This case was national news in China. The head of the local provincial court, um, personally met with Zhao Zohai and bowed to him in an apology on national TV. Um, and the case really made a huge amount of attention. In terms of our work, it really created a huge opening for criminal justice reform in China because this case was sort of the watershed where the Chinese government decided uh, really for the first time to acknowledge that the criminal justice system had serious problems and they permitted and encouraged uh, scholars to study how could innocent people be convicted in the Chinese system. Um, China quickly adopted an exclusionary rule for coerced confessions. They started requiring videotaping of police interrogations in serious cases and more and more people uh, were exonerated. Another high profile case, uh, the Nia Shubin case, was in the national news for uh, really months on end. Nia Shubin had been wrongly convicted of a murder several years ago, and the actual murderer, uh, the actual perpetrator, had uh, confessed. And the Chinese criminal justice system and the legal system was struggling with how to deal with. Uh, the fact that Nyeshu Bin had pre already been executed for this crime and the true perpetrator had now come forward and confessed to the crime. So again, these high profile cases uh, really changed 
uh, the attitudes of people in the government in China, as well as uh, ordinary lawyers and scholars and, and ordinary people. Um, this is just a sort of markup of all the some of the resources we have in the United States. Um, I would say primarily the Innocence Project and through the Innocence Project, the Innocence Network, which is a network of over 50 Innocence Projects in the United States and another dozen or so around the world. Uh, the National Registry of Exonerations, which keeps track of all exonerations in the United States, including DNA exonerations and others. And, and these are just a few of the popular uh, media uh, that have come out in the last few years, the Central Park Five, Making a Murderer, which have publicized the problem of wrongful convictions in the United States. So I just want to start one of the primary challenges in doing this work, whether it's in the United States or anywhere, is that it's hard to get people to acknowledge that wrongful convictions happen, that there are miscarriages of justice. So I just put a, a famous quote here from Learned, Learned Hand. Um, you know, our procedure has always been haunted by the ghost of the innocent man convicted. It's an unreal dream. I think even today, um, many people, many judges and prosecutors and lawyers just find it hard to accept that um, innocent people uh, are wrongly convicted, even though you know, we have many, many examples. Um, but the same attitudes exist really in almost every society. I just, these are other quotes are just things that people have said to me over the years. I remember a prominent criminal justice scholar in China telling me, you know, in, in, Amer in America, proof beyond a reasonable doubt is probably about 80%, you know, you're 80% certain of the defendant's guilt, but in China, the burden of proof is absolute certainty, 100%. Um, I don't, I'm just not using this quote to criticize that person, but just to show a prevailing attitude that uh, the system doesn't make mistakes. I've heard similar comments from Japan that although the, the conviction rate is very high, close to 100%, it's only that high because prosecutors are very careful about reviewing cases. So I think there's a just an overwhelming sense. I think it's hard for us to cognitively accept that such terrible miscarriages of justice can happen in our system. And that's something we have to overcome uh, wherever we do this kind of work. Um, these are some quick statistics on exonerations in the United States. Um, I, I'm not gonna take time to go through all of them, but you know, there's tons of information easily available on the Innocence Project website. And I don't know if Simon Cole has joined us yet, but the uh, National Registry of Exonerations that he runs, uh, again, has uh, tremendous resources in terms of documenting all of the known wrongful conviction cases over the last 30 years, uh, causes, um, uh, and stories of each case. Um, so I've often told our colleagues from Asia, um, we have a lot of experience with convicting innocent people, and that has um, uh, helped us create a large data set of what can go wrong in the criminal justice system. Um, so uh, part of our program was not just looking at what causes um, there are, how is it that innocent people uh, can be convicted of crimes they did not commit, but also who, what kind of institutions do the work to exonerate innocent people. Um, so in the United States, most of this work is done by the innocence, various innocence projects in, uh, around the country, but we also have some other institutions that are important. For example, North Carolina has an innocence commission that works under the court system. Uh, it's a very different model. Um, uh, several prosecutors' offices, including the Bronx, uh, has conviction integrity units in the in the prosecutors' offices to review all cases. And we wanted to give our um, experts from Asia access to all these different types of institutions, so they could choose and see what might work best in their country. 